come in! What did you do to my room? Huh. Welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy. So I just finished re-watching Home Alone, and I've had a lot of free time lately because for some reason we haven't had any customers in here since March. And I'm starting to go a little crazy. Shh! Anyways, I've seen Home Alone so many times that I'm beginning to understand what it's actually about. This movie is actually a study in solipsism. Reba, tell the people what solipsism is. Solipsism is the theory that the self is all that can be known to exist. Exactly, thank you. Solipsism is when someone believes that they are the only real thing in the universe and that everyone else is, say, a robot or a simulation, a TV actor, pick your genre. See, Kevin McAllister is a solipsist who believes the world only exists for his benefit. But also, if not for the events in this movie, he would have grown up to become a deranged sociopath. Maybe I'm overthinking this, but let me explain. The movie is all about solitude. I mean, the word alone is right there in the title. Solipsism means that fundamentally, we can only ever truly know ourselves and empathy with others is impossible. When the movie starts, Kevin comes off as a precocious youngster. Uncle Frank won't let me watch the movie, but the big kids can. Why can't I? And it seems like his family bullies him, especially mean Uncle Frank. Look what you did, you little jerk. But go back and watch this whole opening sequence again, and you'll see that Kevin is a jerk. When his mother doesn't pay attention to him, he throws a fit. Kevin, out of the room. Hang up the phone and make me, why don't you? Did you ever think that maybe, just maybe, people are treating him bad because he's a genuinely terrible person? There are 15 people in this house. You're the only one who has to make trouble. Or how about Uncle Frank? See, we're supposed to hate him, right? You little jerk. Uncle Frank wouldn't let Kevin watch Angels with Filthy Souls, a movie that does frighten Kevin when he watches it later on. And when he does snap at Kevin later, this is probably the last straw in a long line of annoying behaviors that Kevin inflicted upon him. Kevin is upset that he doesn't get a cheese pizza all to himself, as if it's that hard to pick a few pepperonis off a slice of za. How come he didn't bring more cheese pizzas? He's a spoiled brat, as alluded to by his father on the plane. The only flying I ever did as a kid was in the family station wagon. It wasn't in France. And later, Harry points out that the McAllisters are the wealthiest family on their street. <laughs> and that's the one, Marvin. That's the silver tuna. So you get the feeling that the world usually revolves around Kevin and that his extended family has inconvenienced his perfect little reality. This is so full of people. It makes me sick. So he retaliates in anger. Kevin's life of indulgence and debauchery is hinted at by his favorite pizza place, Little Nero's. Nero was the Roman emperor best remembered for his cruelty, debauchery, and selfishness. He performed with a fiddle while Rome burned. Literally no one asked you. No one. So if not for the events in this movie, Kevin would have gone on to live what would appear to him to be a charmed life, as his father's wealth and connections paved an easy path for him through economic and social hardships, a kind of living where Kevin would have surrounded himself with sycophants to bolster his ego, who made him believe that the world owed him whatever he desired, be it money, fame, or the presidency. You should avoid talking about politics on the internet. Don't tell me what to do. So you know what made me realize this movie is about solipsism? When Kevin wakes up, it never occurs to him that his family could have left him behind. He's so important they could never do that. He believes that he has the magical power to wish them away into the ether. I made my family disappear. Then he celebrates the erasure of his family like some adorable version of Anthony. I made my family disappear. Yeah! Then like any dictator establishing a new regime, his first act is to remove the dissidents by firing squad. Then he tears up social norms by breaking the rules and daring someone to challenge him. Guys, I'm eating junk and watching rubbish. You better come out and stop me. And when he is finally alone, he looks directly into the camera at us. This signals that we are now in his world. He speaks to us. We are inside his mind. So what follows over the next 80 minutes or so is Kevin's reckoning with the facets of his subconscious. Now think about this. Why is he afraid of Harry and Marv? He sees Harry dressed as a police officer in the opening scene. So when he recognizes him later, he assumes that this guy is a police officer, just undercover or off duty. Why is he going faster? I told you something's wrong. See, I knew he looked at me weird. Why would he run? So why is he so afraid of the police? Why run from the cops instead of returning the toothbrush? Because he believes he made his entire family disappear and he doesn't want to suffer the legal consequences of 11 murders. 
so he deters Harry and Marv, the police, by pretending that his family is still alive. After all, you can't lock him up for murdering people who were never killed. But these artificial people actually represent how Kevin sees others. As a solipsist, he believes that he is the only person who is real and everyone else might as well be plastic or a coat rack or a piece of cardboard. So Harry and Marv serve as Kevin's guilt, trying to intrude on the splendid seclusion that he's crafted for himself. So in this scene, he's actually running away from his own moral failings. Now, I'm not saying Harry and Marv were all in his mind. After all, his dad finds Harry's gold tooth at the end of the movie, proving the experience is real. I'm only speaking metaphorically. The worst kind of twist ending is, oh, well, maybe it was all in his head. I'm looking at you, Joker. Since the wet bandits represent Kevin's fear of being caught, let's talk about Kevin's other fears. Do you hear me? I'm not afraid anymore. Because while the burglars represent his external conflict, the internal conflict is all about him conquering his fears and achieving empathy. First of all, he's afraid of the furnace in the basement, which he visualizes as a fiery monster buried in the pit of his house. In many ways, this furnace represents the very concept of fear, a burning, forbidden cask buried in a subconscious. You sound like you have been reading a thesaurus. I will end you with a pencil. But Kevin has to face his fear of the furnace in order to do laundry. So his desire to be self-sufficient outweighs his fear of the unknown. It's only my imagination. It's only my imagination. Now that clip is actually key. Kevin believes that he is literally bringing the furnace to life just as he made his family disappear. Now later, the wet bandits flood another basement. This is an external representation of Kevin's fears of the furnace being cooled after he defends his home. This is it. Don't get scared now. Ah, Kevin is also initially afraid of the movie Angels with Filthy Souls, but eventually he becomes desensitized to TV violence and uses it to gain food and intimidate others. <laughs> Kevin comes to embrace the role of gangster. It makes him feel powerful. He even becomes a vessel for his voice. Keep the change, you filthy animal. And also he shoots guns at strangers. Earlier, I said that Kevin was on a dark path toward an empty, solipsist existence but he avoids this life because of old man Marley. See, Marley serves as a warning sign to Kevin. I'm not welcome with my son. This is the end result of living a selfish life. If Kevin cuts off his family, he will end up a lonely old man who tries to make friends by salting sidewalks. After all, Marley takes his name from another Marley who prevented Ebenezer Scrooge from living a solipsistic life. What are you constructing? Oh, it's a project. Kevin is terrified of the old man because he associates him with his loneliness and death, when in fact the old man actually represents empathy and connection. So after hearing Marley's story, Kevin begins to better understand his own life. I've been kind of a pain lately. I said some things I shouldn't have. I really haven't been too good this year. It's also fitting that this reckoning happens in a holy place that in this movie at least, represents the spirit of empathy. Oh, you're always welcome to church. See, Harry and Marv, who are without any empathy, refuse to even approach this holy sanctum. I'm not going in there. Me neither. Kevin, with his power to make people disappear, is a kind of god. And like most gods, he becomes lonely. So instead of material possessions, now he desires for his family to return from the ether. But he can't do this alone. He has to appeal to a higher power. Santa. Please tell him that instead of presents this year, I just want my family back. I just want my kids back. This is a way for him to acknowledge that his power has limits and he requires the help of others. So look at Kevin's love of gangster movies and the way he gleefully maims these intruders instead of just calling the cops. Let's be clear, Kevin didn't hurt these men to defend his house. He hurt them because it pleased him to do so. Yes! Yes! See, on the street, it's wrong to burn, stab, shoot, and torture people. But once Kevin learns that these crooks aren't cops, we'll come back about nine o'clock. He has a free pass to torture them. This is my house. I have to defend it. After all, when someone breaks into your house, it's self-defense, isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, now you got nothing to say. The last act of the movie is a symphony of torment where Kevin is able to indulge his sociopathic lust. You guys give up or you're thirsty for more? He takes his own fears, the basement, the spider, the movie, and he transfers them to the burglars. See, Kevin doesn't succeed in this movie because he physically destroys the burglars. In order to win the day, he had to learn empathy. 
Harry and Marv even threaten him with a kind of pain empathy at the movie's climax. What are you going to do to him, Harry? I'm going to do exactly what he did to us. I'm going to burn his head with a blowtorch. But then it's his empathy for old man Marley that saves his life. So if not for Kevin learning a lesson in humility and rejecting his solipsistic worldview, he would have been murdered in the back of Joe Pesci's van. But what a way to go. So is Kevin a better person at the end of the movie? Oh, well, he certainly made old man Marley's life a little bit better, but he's still a bad tipper and ruined a perfectly good trip to Paris. So let me know your thoughts on Home Alone down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And let me know what movie you'd like for me to overthink next. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I am Ryan Airy. Did you tell them about- Quiet.